On the evening of April 6, 1997, the tranquil streets near Payne Hollow Road were shattered by the echo of gunfire. Arriving on the scene, Green County Deputy Jeff Morgan was greeted by the eerie sight of an abandoned blue Chevy Citation. Sergeant Frank Waddle was the first to notice the family, lifeless, lying in a ditch, and seemingly had been arranged in the shape of a cross. A mother, a father, daughter, and son. The parents' legs were grotesquely squashed into the road, with the imprint of tire tracks stamped into their trousers. The daughter lay unconscious on top of her father's abdomen, only showing signs of life through sporadic twitches, while the son was sprawled across his mother. His face was buried within the mud. Deputy Morgan, in search for life, touched the son's shoulder. Morgan said, and quote, when I touched him, he started crying. I held him and just stayed there with him in the ditch until the ambulance arrived. What do you say to someone when they're shot full of holes? I just tried to tell him, nobody's going to hurt you. You're going to be okay. This case is truly senseless. Although it was highly publicized at the time, it happened over 25 years ago. So feel it's time to look back over this brutal case. But before we dive in, I want to let you know about my second channel called Grim Tales, where I am covering true stories that are shocking but not murderous. I think if you find this content interesting, then you should see what's over there. Link to the channel is in the comments. And don't forget to like this video if you want to see my next one. It really helps me out. Thank you. This video is created solely for educational and documentary purposes. It does not endorse or condone the criminal actions described within. Vida Lililid, hailing from the picturesque city of Bergen, Norway, made the bold journey to Florida in his 20s, bringing with him youthful aspirations and desires. Born in May 1962, the youngest of four siblings, he would soon meet a woman in his new surroundings. Her name was Delphina, a New Jersey native, born in March 1969. Together, they decided to move to Miami, where they got married in February 1989. With the birth of their daughter, Tabitha, in 1990, the couple yearned for a quieter life to nurture their growing family. They wanted to get away from the hustle and bustle of the big city, and they eventually found a place called Powell on the outskirts of Knoxville, Tennessee, a haven that promised tranquility for their children's upbringing. It was there, in the close-knit community, that they welcomed their son Peter in 1995, and soon after, in 1996, they settled into their idyllic forever home, a 50-year-old house brimming with potential and dreams for the future. The house was a sign of new beginnings, with plans to refurbish an annex for Delfina's mother, Vida started working as a busboy for a local Holiday Inn. Delphina dedicated herself to the home education of Tabitha and Peter. Together, although finances were tight, they lived a life defined by hard work, the joy of simple pleasures, and the unwavering commitment to family. The Lililids, devout in their faith as Jehovah's Witnesses, spent the weekend absorbed in a spiritual convention in Johnson City, eager to deepen their devotion and learn how they can better serve God. As the gathering drew to a close on April 6, 1997, their fellowship invited them to go to lunch with the rest of the community. But the Lililids, mindful of their modest budget and had recently stretched to purchase new attire for the convention, politely declined. Seeking a cheaper, more simple option, they chose instead to have a picnic 
at a roadside rest area as they journeyed home in their trusty 1987 Dodge minivan. At around 7pm, with dusk approaching, they pulled off the highway at mile marker 41 in Greene County, Tennessee. Little Peter had been complaining of an earache and his father, Vidar, took him for a walk to try and clear his head. Meanwhile, Delphina and Tabitha made their way towards the toilets. It was there that Delphina bumped into her friend and fellow Jehovah's Witness, Karen Sinclair, and her daughter, Cara. They were fellow attendees, returning from the same convention. As Vida and Peter waited at the visitor center's entrance, a seemingly innocent moment became the beginning of a nightmare. There, in the fading light, the Lililid family's path intersected with those who would mark their family's history forever. In the sleepy streets of Pikeville, Kentucky, six teenagers found themselves bound not by the laws of the small town, but by their own troubled pasts. Pikeville offered little in the way of things to do for people of their age, leading to the town's youth to often rent out motel rooms, away from the watchful eyes of authority. It was in such a room at the Collie Motel on April 4th, two days before they would go on to shock the community, that these six teenagers gathered. They were drawn together because they all shared similar fractured families, academic struggles, emotional scars, and a past marred by substance abuse, addiction, and essaying. Within the walls of the motel, they were drinking and taking substances together. The carpet bore a charred imprint of 666 that two of them had just done. It was used more as a defiant symbol against the grain of societal norms. Seances and rituals would provide an escape, a sense of control. As candles flickered, some sliced their skin with razor blades. An act of rebellion as much as a cry for help, while others contemplated a more permanent escape from their situations. The destruction they brought upon the motel room was a mirror to their inner chaos. Amongst them, Natasha Cornett and Jason Bryant were drinking each other's blood, a macabre act that they believed would cement their bond. Karen Howe, another in their group, joined this grisly pact. To them, it was a symbol of unity. To the outside world, the media, the prosecution, these acts painted a picture of sinister occult devil worship. But to the eyes of psychologists and counselors, these were lost youths, grappling with their place in the world. The group's descent into darker intentions felt more real after they left the Collie Motel. They went back to Natasha's trailer, where the atmosphere grew heavy and ominous. There, Natasha told her mother, Madonna Wallen, that they were going to start Armageddon. Karen also told Madonna that the end of time is coming. Madonna, later recounting the experience, could only describe the demeanor of the group as zombie-like. On that fateful Sunday, April 6th, the grim plans started to become a reality. The group targeted the home of a police officer, where Jason created a commotion outside, a calculated distraction. Meanwhile, the other members slipped inside, with their hands reaching for violence. They stole a 9mm and a 25 caliber gun, along with two boxes of ammunition and roughly $500 in cash. It was a theft that would fuel their sinister vision, setting them on a path from which there could be no return, setting their sights on New Orleans as the place for their new beginning. The six teens embarked on their journey the same day the Lililid family faced their fate. Cramped inside Joseph Risner's dilapidated blue Chevy Citation, the vehicle on its last legs was unlikely to last the whole journey. But Joseph pushed it hard, flouting speed limits as if they were in a rush to embark on their new beginnings. Their quest for escape 
hit a snag in Gate City, Virginia, where estate troopers flashing lights halted their journey. Clocked at over 20 miles per hour over the speed limit, they were slapped with a ticket. Although this was just a minor scrape with the law and they were allowed to continue, the group knew that their reliance on the Chevy Citation was soon to become a big problem. It was impending breakdown and they would eventually have to abandon it and find a suitable replacement. Whilst the teens are driving the Chevy Citation, I want to explain a little bit about their past. Natasha Cornett, cast by the media as the leader of this grim group, alleged to have been speaking to angels and demons since her early childhood. She had an obsession with witchcraft and referred to herself as Satan's daughter. Natasha's youth was marred by substance abuse, starting with alcohol and spiraling into heavier things. Once a polite youth with academic promise, Natasha's path veered off course in the seventh grade, where she developed an eating disorder and she began to slice herself. Hospitalization in Lexington revealed a severe manic depressive condition and an alarming desire to harm herself and others. At 14, a forgery charge led to probation. A year later, a program intended for troubled youth aimed to help her through school and family issues, but this failed to keep her on track. By 17, she was briefly married to a man called Stephen Cornett, but when this ended, there was a steep decline in her already fragile mental state. A short-lived move to New Orleans exposed her to further trauma with a brutal assault where she was essayed by five men, leaving deep psychological scars, all confirming the disturbing extent of her long-standing mental and emotional turmoil. This was a female who once threatened her own mother with a knife, and her dream was to live out the film Natural Born Killers. Now doctors were saying and quote, she is clearly mentally and emotionally disturbed and has been for a number of years. In the suffocating getaway car, Natasha sat beside her best friend, Karen Howell. Their bond was cemented by a shared fascination with witchcraft. Karen's history was a catalogue of abuse and domestic turmoil. Essayed by her uncle and cousin, she was also witness to the violent arguments between her parents. This all left marks on her, leading her to harm herself in her early teens, and she attempted to end her own suffering four times. School became another battleground for Karen leading to transfers between three different schools before she ultimately abandoned her education. At home, her mother's presence did little to bring her down to a sense of normality and comfort. Instead, she turned to a Ouija board, seeking conversations with demonic entities, perhaps as a plea for understanding or escape. Substance abuse was another layer of her attempt to cope, to dull the pain of her troubled life. Driving in the car was Karen's boyfriend, Joseph Risner. Joseph, who is the oldest of the group, had been a good student up until his mother and stepfather's divorce. He then started drinking and using substances. Joseph was born in Hazard, Kentucky. On October 13th, 1976, he grew up without knowing his biological father, and later he adopted his stepfather's surname. After his family relocated to Georgia in 1986, his parents divorced two years later, and Joseph, then 14, returned to Kentucky with his mother, Mary. Around this time, he became involved in church activities. However, Joseph had already been exposed to substance use from a young age, starting with less harmful substances at 10 and progressing quickly to more serious ones by 11. He also claimed to have intimate experiences with two babysitters at 12. 
something that now would be recognized as abuse. In 1993, his mother remarried and smoking substances together became a regular part of family bonding time. At 18, Joseph was in junior year at high school. His personal life was complex. He briefly dated Natasha Cornett before maintaining a friendship and later dating her best friend, Karen Howell. His schooling was interrupted when he joined the army in 1995, only to be discharged for substance abuse. Joseph dropped it all to start afresh with his new friends and hit the road to New Orleans. Natasha was now dating another member of the group, Edward Dean Mullins, who found himself caught in the turbulent currents of the group's dynamics at the young age of 19. Born on January 26th, 1978, in Harold, Kentucky, Dean's life was on a relatively typical trajectory until a series of pivotal decisions led him off course. He attended Betsy Lane High School, just like most of the group, but he never made it to graduation, dropping out in his final year. Dean had held a job at a local grocery store, and notably, he had managed to steer clear of any criminal trouble. Yet, his regular attendance at church ceased when he began to date Natasha. This new relationship sparked a negative and concerning shift in his behavior, one that did not go unnoticed by his family. His parents, witnessing these changes, attempted to intervene and steer their son back to the life he once knew. However, Dean's connection with Natasha proved stronger than familial pleas. Moving in with Natasha, Dean was seemingly prepared to walk away from his past entirely, going so far as to plan their wedding. Jason, the youngest of the group, was born on July 18th, 1982, in a small coal mining town of Hellier, Kentucky. Despite his youth, he was no stranger to the juvenile system. Already on probation, his life was marred by a long-standing battle with both substance and alcohol abuse, reflecting a deeper struggle that began early in his life. With an IQ hovering around 85, Jason faced challenges that extended beyond the norm. His emotional and social development were notably lagging, suggesting that he struggled with issues that perhaps went unaddressed or misunderstood by those around him. At the time he was drawn into the group, he was involved in a mental health treatment program, yet even the structured support of the program was insufficient to keep him anchored, and he chose to leave it behind, lured away by the promise of belonging and escape offered by the sect. In the passenger seat beside him was 18-year-old Crystal Sergil, born on March 13th, 1979, in Harold, Kentucky. Crystal was an above average student until she entered high school and began using substances. Crystal's experiences prior to the tragic events involving the Lillilid family were relatively minor infractions, typical of a high school student. Smoking in the locker room and an altercation defending her brother However, far more severe and hidden pain in her life came to light in December 1996, when Crystal revealed the long-standing harm inflicted by her stepfather, beginning when she was very young and escalating when she entered her teens. She was essayed constantly by him. This abuse ceased only when she got a boyfriend. Her stepfather's confession and guilty plea should have been a turning point, but instead Crystal faced disbelief from her own mother and several relatives. They refused to accept her stepfather did this to her and that she must have made this up. Crystal's life had been a journey through the care system and 13 different households until finally moving in with Natasha and thus being part of the group. 
Karen needed to use the restroom, so they pulled off at the next rest area they came upon. Mile marker 41, the same as the Lily Lid family. Natasha and Karen, having shared the front seat, stepped out to use the toilet. Meanwhile, the rest of the group lingered, their conversation spiraling into the criminal. They considered hot wiring a car to continue their escape. The Chevy, now close to breaking down, along with the stolen cash, guns, and the trail they had inadvertently left with a speeding ticket in Virginia, pressured them to find a swift and discreet solution. They needed a reliable vehicle, one that could accommodate all six without drawing attention, and they needed it urgently. Vida and Peter were waiting by the door at the visitor center when Natasha and Karen came out after using the restroom. Vida, ever the faithful, offered a warm smile and a question about faith. He asked, do you believe in God? Perhaps perceiving their youthful appearance and all black attire as a silent call for guidance. Karen said in response, no, he never answers my prayers. This prompted Vidar to offer a religious pamphlet, showing his commitment to sharing his faith. Vidar asked the young woman to join him at a nearby picnic table. Joseph and Jason followed them to the table. They were curious about the women's interaction with the strangers, seeing as they were in quite a pressing situation. Joseph had taken note of the Lililid family's van earlier, and a plan began to form in his mind. As Vida introduced the teens to the Jehovah's Witness faith, Delphina Lililid said goodbye to her friend Karen and joined the picnic table, unaware of the brewing intentions nearby. Joseph returned to the car where Edward and Crystal waited, his mind set on action. With a quiet but ominous tone, he told them to be ready for action. He armed himself with a 9mm handgun and went back to the picnic table. Approaching Vidar and the rest of the family, Joseph's demeanor shifted as he surveyed the car park for any potential witnesses. Once satisfied, he pulled out the gun discreetly and aimed it at Vidar and made his intentions known. With an apologetic tone, he said, and quote, I'm sorry about this. Everybody, just be quiet. Nothing's going to happen to you. We just need the van. Using the gun to control them, Joseph directed the Lililid family back into their minivan. What began as a peaceful evening had now turned into a nightmare. Vida, trying desperately to defuse the situation, offered everything he had, his wallet, his keys, hoping to bargain for his family's safety. But it was no good. The teens wanted the van and the family. The Lililids were herded into the van along with Natasha, Karen, Joseph and Jason. Vidar was rendered powerless. He was told to drive, which he did, away from any signs of safety. Behind them, Edward and Crystal trailed in Joseph's car. Joseph had the 9mm in his hand to keep Vidar doing as he was told. The rest of the people were sat in the van fairly quiet. It was tense, but in the very back, Delphina started singing to her daughter, Tabitha. Jason shouted and quote, You better shut up. Tabitha was noticeably scared of the teens. So Karen turned around and smiled at her. In response, Tabitha opened her tiny palm and offered both Karen and Natasha some Hershey's chocolate kisses, a tragic but sweet sign of innocence. The Lililid family and the six continued down the interstate a couple of miles and took the first exit. Vidar drove another mile and was then told to turn onto Payne Hollow Road. After a few hundred yards, Vidar asked if this was a good place to stop and Joseph said it was. Beside the road, the Lililid family held each other close, praying to God to protect them. Joseph and Jason stepped aside, discussing what to do next. Natasha was worried things were about to get too far out of hand. She told Jason 
not to harm the little ones. She then tried to reason with the parents, saying that she can't stop what is about to happen, but she can keep Tabitha and Peter safe. Vidar gave a firm response, saying that if he and his wife are murdered, then they will be as well. A few feet away, at the van, Jason questioned Joseph on whether they should release or kill the family. Joseph, uncertain, asked for Jason's opinion, to which Jason chillingly suggested that they should kill them. Vidar, desperate to protect his family, again offered his wallet and van to the captors, pleading for their lives. Delfina said that they couldn't identify the teens anyway, as they all dressed alike, hoping that this would convince them to let the family go unharmed. They were desperate. The events that happened next are not exactly clear. Testimonies from Joseph, Natasha, Karen, Dean and Crystal align closely to say this is what transpired. It was Jason who seized control of the situation. When the van stopped, Joseph handed his gun to Natasha, stating that he could not go through with their plan. However, Jason was. He told the Lilylid family to line up in front of a ditch. Despite assurances from the family that they would not go to the police, Jason continued. Karen and Natasha reportedly tried to persuade Jason to release the family. Jason had allegedly promised the women that he would not harm the siblings, leading Karen and Natasha to go back to the van where Joseph waited. Forensic evidence painted a grim picture. Dr. Cleland Blake, a forensic pathologist, testified that Vida was shot multiple times. The initial shot from a 9mm struck his right eye and exited his temple, likely rendering him unconscious immediately. Vida then sustained an additional three gunshot wounds to his upper chest and two more were above his nipple. Interestingly, there were two different types of guns used to inflict these wounds upon him. Delfina's last moments were marked by an unimaginable brutality that no human should ever endure. She was shot a total of eight times. The first two bullets shattered the femur in her left thigh and a bone in her left arm. The injuries were so severe that they would have caused her to collapse in agony. As she lay on the ground, three more shots were fired into the left side of her abdomen, a merciless act of violence. Her body, already ravaged by pain, was violated by three additional bullets. One of them lodged itself in the center of her liver, a deadly wound from which there was no coming back. Among the eight bullets that tore through Delfina, two were from a 25 caliber pistol with the rest coming from the 9mm. These wounds did not kill her instantly. Instead, she was condemned to suffer up to 25 harrowing minutes after the first devastating shot. And things only got worse. It was now Tabitha's turn, and Delfina was most likely conscious to witness it. The tragedy that befell young Tabitha was both swift and devastating. She sustained a single gunshot to the head from the 25 caliber weapon. The bullet's ruthless trajectory began on the left side of her skull and exited behind her right ear, inflicting catastrophic damage. Tabitha's life, full of potential and innocence, was extinguished instantly as the injury led to immediate brain death. Peter Lillilid's ordeal was a heartbreaking and violent assault. He was struck by two bullets from the 25 caliber pistol. The first round entered behind his right ear and made its exit near his right eye. The second bullet pierced his back and tore through his chest, resulting in the collapse of his right lung and significant damage to his right eye. After the initial barrage of gunfire, with the 25mm. Jason returned to the van and shouted, they're still effing alive. Jason then grabbed the 9mm handgun and shot at the family, delivering the final fatal shots. J 
Jason Bryant's account was very different to the rest of the groups. He distanced himself from the murders, pinning the responsibility on Joseph Risner and Dean Mullins. According to Jason, he could not handle such violence, claiming that he had gone back to the van and shut his eyes, unable to witness the horror that the fellow group members inflicted upon the family. Now, we will never know the full truth, but I want to explain that Jason was too young to be tried for the death penalty. So his argument is that the others got together and blamed the murders on him in order to save themselves. Crime scene evidence also suggests that there was two shooters, but how this happened, we don't exactly know. Not far from the crime scene, Mark Gabby, who was working on a construction site nearby, heard the gunshots. But it was not unusual to hear gunshots in the area as people went hunting around there. So initially, he dismissed it. A strange silence followed, then noises that he described as chilling, likening them to hyenas laughing. Then more gunshots followed. Mark was now suspicious and he phoned the police along with another local person, and between 8.30 and 9pm, law enforcement received two calls of gunfire located near Payne Hollow Road. Upon arriving at the grim scene, Green County Deputy Jeff Morgan found the blue Chevy Citation abandoned, headlights glaring into the darkness, keys missing, and the license plates had been removed. The vehicle was perched awkwardly on a stump, half sunk into a muddy ditch. Frank Waddle, who was with Morgan, was met with a harrowing sight. A pile of bodies, discarded seemingly into the shape of a cross. Vida and Delphina were found lifeless, their legs grotesquely flattened into the road, marked by the imprints of tire tracks, the result of Joseph Risner's escape in the van. The prosecution saw it as a deliberate and final act of cruelty, while Risner would later claim that it was an accident, a result of not being used to driving a van of that size, and the need for a wide U-turn. Sadly, Delphina was most likely alive when this happened. Amidst the gruesome scene, Tabitha was found lying atop her father's abdomen, her life hanging by a thread. She was occasionally twitching, and this was her only sign of life. Young Peter was atop of his mother, his face pressed into the mud. It was Deputy Morgan who went to touch Peter's shoulder. As he did, Peter began to cry. Morgan recounted the profound moment with poignant simplicity. When I touched him, he started crying. I held him and just stayed there with him in the ditch until the ambulance arrived. In those long moments that felt like an eternity, Morgan offered the only comfort he could to wounded Peter, assuring him, nobody's going to hurt you, you're going to be okay. The two siblings, Peter and Tabitha, were rushed to a Knoxville hospital, both fighting for their lives. The car left behind at the crime scene proved to be pivotal. It was the only thing that linked the perpetrators to the crime and officers quickly found the vehicle's identification number. This quickly led investigators straight to the owner, Mary Castle, who was Joseph Risner's mother, who reported her son missing for two days. The group's initial plan to flee to New Orleans was scrapped by Jason, who pointed out that Natasha's mother was aware of their intended destination, but things were different. They had just, in their minds, murdered an entire family in cold blood. A hasty decision was made to head for Mexico in the hopes of escaping US jurisdiction. The group did make it out of Mexico, but it was chaotic. Jason sustained gunshot wounds to his hand and leg. Contradictory testimonies arose regarding the origins of his injuries with Jason claiming that Joseph shot him for hesitating to accept the blame for the murders, while others suggested it was self-inflicted in order to form an alibi later in court. Upon their attempt to pass a checkpoint, 
they were found not to have proper identification. Mexican authorities turned them back, escorting them to the US border. On April 8th, around 5 p.m., they reached the US Customs at Douglas, Arizona. Inspector Mark Springer entered the tag number of the van into the system. The van's tag number triggered an alert for triple homicide and the six were immediately detained. A search of the van and suspects revealed the teens kept items from the lily lids as grim trophies of their crime. Natasha had a piece of Vidar's belt and a picture of Tabitha in her purse. Karen had a Hello Kitty diary lock which belonged to Tabitha and Crystal had a keyring to the Lilylids family home. None of these items had any monetary value and it was a sick reminder of their guilt and if all the evidence wasn't incriminating enough, the murder weapons were also found. The discovery fueled public outrage and grief in Knox County. Calls for justice were strong. People were in the streets. One shop owner even had six nooses hanging outside his shop. The public were enraged. As the legal proceedings commenced, Judge Eddie Beckner faced relentless defense pleas for separate trials, all of which he denied. The four adults were faced with the prospect of the death penalty, while the two juveniles, Karen and Jason, were confronted with the possibility of life without parole. The collective fate of the six now lay in the hands of the Tennessee justice system, with a community's cry for retribution very strong. A crowd had gathered at the court, chanting burn in hell as the defendants entered. The trial for the events of April 6th was set for March 1998, but it never happened. In February, all six defendants pleaded guilty to murder and a deal was given to them. It would guarantee all six defendants would live out the rest of their lives in prison. The details of who exactly did what to this day are still unknown. Everyone involved told different stories and even now people close to the case can't agree on a single version of what happened after they arrived at Payne Hollow Lane. Following the attack, Tabitha passed away in the hospital the day after with her uncle's consent to end life support and allow her organs to be donated. Peter endured a long recovery involving a prosthetic eye and many surgeries. After a custody dispute between Vida and Delfina's families, Peter moved to Sweden to live with his aunt. Though he made significant progress, he didn't fully recover from his injuries. Later, he returned to the US where he has since built a life for himself, getting married and establishing a career. To this day, the six members of the group appeal for their freedom. Some claim that they were too young to sign such an agreement and did not fully understand the consequences of doing so. In 2017, Karen would send a letter to the media and this is some of her words, and quote, I simply want the public to see that the 17-year-old girl I was as an individual, not with the various lies pumped out by the media over the last two decades, have made me out to be. Everything that I could recall would replay over and over in my head, as if it was some movie stuck on replay. If only I hadn't seized by fear, if only I could have thought more rationally, etc. I didn't understand for the longest time what was wrong with me. I hated myself because of how much I would just fall into pieces under pressure. I couldn't forgive myself for a very long time. It took me years to be able to do so with some help. Anyone who knows me could tell you I was no killer, nor would I ever approve in the murder of anyone. I never had a murderous or violent bone in my body. To suggest otherwise is silly. I was simply a screwed up youth with poor coping skills and an inability to process or deal with stressful situations. This was the most frightening and stressful situation of my 17 year old life. So naturally, 
I didn't deal with it the way a healthy or normal kid might have. I say might because nobody truly knows how they would react in a situation like that. Things happen so fast and it's all so insane. If only they'd consider that before deciding that I was some sort of evil person with murder in my heart and blood on my mind. Nothing could be further from the truth. I was 17 years old then. I am 37 now. I've grown up so much in prison and even though it's been 20 years, my heart still weeps for the heartache that family and friends had to endure. My tears still fall for the victims of the crime. There is not a day goes by that I don't think about Peter Lillilid and wonder how he is doing. I have always hoped that his heart is beautiful and that the tragedy of what happened to his family didn't cast a shadow over it. I don't believe that I deserve to die in prison for murder. Karen Howell I read her part of the letter as I think it's important to understand that these were messed up young people. But not that it excuses what they did, but more to understand how dangerous they can be. This is a truly horrific crime, and in the end, it claimed many victims. Thank you for watching. Until next time, stay sane.